It was a place for um, aristocrats and prostitutes and uh, Balzac and, and various others um, placed novels there, uh, scenes in their novels from there. Fun to walk down it. Nick, the um, House of Nicholas Flamel, um, perhaps some of you know it from Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code. It's purported to be the oldest house in Paris uh, from 1407. Victor Hugo has a scene in The Hunchback of Notre Dame here, but it's probably most popular because it was in um, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. The Nicholas Flamel was a scribe and he and his wife took in students here, but he was known as an alchemist and supposedly turned metal to gold. Um, there are a lot of courtyards that are so interesting in Paris that have long histories. Um, a duke bought this, it was a town hall at one time when Napoleon Bonaparte married Josephine in a civil ceremony. Uh, you know, one of the things I love about Paris is you can walk in and see sculpture uh, anywhere. This, in, it, this is a sculpture of Dreyfus and it is now um, the Muse Museum of History and Art of Judaism. A lot of special exhibits there, uh, often Jacques Chirac converted it in, 18, in 1986 uh, to a museum. Jewish Museum. And in the Murray, um, which covers the third and fourth um, arrondissement, you have Place de Vosges. Most people know about it these days. It was built originally conceived by Henry IV. It is a perfect square. Um, it, there are a lot of restaurants and art galleries in there and um, fairly well known. You'll see kids playing in the fountain there these days. And also in the Murray, um, we have a famous Rue de Rossier Street where Las du Falafel, if you're hungry, um, it's supposedly the best falafel in all of Paris. There are several stores. Um, I always see a long lineup of people waiting here, but you can also eat inside. It's a fun, fun place. Um, so we're moving on to... Um, the area around Notre Dame and Hotel du Sully is um, another huge courtyard, a lot of sculpture on the facade. Um, you can walk in there. It's now the home of the National Historic Monument Organization, but it has a pretty dicey past. Uh, the first owner squandered his money gambling and it was uh, his creditor, Duke de Sully, bought it, I took it over from him. And the old Duke loved dancing under the arches with young ladies of ill repute, but he had a very um, great sense of equality because he built a secret stairway for his young wife so her lovers could go up there and none of them would meet each other. Um, moving into the fifth, I don't know if any of you have been to the Arab Institute, um, it was a project for French architect Jean Novel and a collaboration between Arab and French architects. It what's interesting about it, it has a split facade. The north facade is all glass, but you're looking at the south facade, which has mechanized ca uh, panels like a camera aperture, and it opens and closes to let the light in. And um, it has a lot of different exhibits and a great museum shop. Nothing to look at on the outside of the, this, this facade, but it's in the fifth, it's Hemingway's house. So he moved here in 1922 with his wife Hadley, his first wife. And in a movable feast, he describes it um, as a tiny walk-up flat on the fourth floor that they had. It had no running water and he used a toilet on the landing, which was pretty typical of the 1920s. He describes it as an antiseptic container, not uncomfortable to anyone who has used a Michigan outhouse. Uh, there are markets in every single um, neighborhood. This happens to be a fun one in the fifth. 
Um, and before we leave the fifth, I have to take you to the Abbey Bookstore, which is run by Brian here, who is an expat Canadian, is an English, um, English language bookstore. Uh, it's a historic street. It used to be called the Rue de Ecrivain, um, Writer's Street, but then the papermakers took it over, so it is now Parsham and Curie. Um, the facade is a historic monument, and Brian, it's a very narrow place. It's amazing that he can find absolutely any book you want in this very crowded space, which spills out onto the street. Um, very close by, within walking distance, in the sixth is Saint Sulpice. Um, Hemingway used to sit in a cafe next to it. It was built over 100 years, which is why it has strange proportions. But Hemingway used to sit here and contemplate the four bishops mount, um, monument here. And um, you may know it as a scene from Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code again. It was a gruesome murder. There was a gruesome murder here. And this is for Natasha, who asked me about Luxembourg Gardens. I had not originally put this in the talk because it seems to me it's probably the most famous garden. People hang out there all the time. There's a great museum in the corner and they have special exhibits. And this is Natasha's, one of I, her favorite fountains. She can perhaps talk about it a little bit more. Um, there's a lot in the area. And in one of my favorite markets um, is the Raspai Marche on Sundays. It's open during the week, um, one of the days, but on Sundays it becomes an organic market. It gets very crowded. It's expensive. There's a little bit of everything. It's um, in this map, you can see here's the gardens. It's a pretty short walk, maybe five, 10 minutes to it. Good place to buy gifts for people. And in the Southwest corner, um, there is a little museum, which was the studio and house of uh, this Russian sculptor, um, uh, Zadkin. Um, he was half, at first he was, um, did African Greek sculpture and then he got into Cubism, but he was half Jewish. So during World War II, he fled to the United States. His wife, who was not Jewish, hid all his sculptures, which are pretty big, in basements around Paris. And after the war, he went back. Someone was living there. He sued to get the house back. It's a great little place. It's not very crowded. And I believe you can also have um, coffee or a little snack in the garden there now. And in the seventh grand uh, department store, worth looking at the interior, even if you don't like department stores or being in them, it was the first modern department store in Paris. It started as a hosiery, um, a hosiery store, and it offered delivery to homes as far as a horse could travel in Paris. Across the street is a huge food court, great place also to buy gifts for people. If you have a connection, this is also in the 7th, it's owned by an American. Um, it was originally built by Pierre Charot in 1931 uh, for a gynecologist. They take very few people on tours there. You sort of have to have a connection between uh, on architecture or interior design. Um, they only take about 10, 12 people at a time through there. It's fascinating, very art deco and industrial construction inside with some fascinating um, mechanisms. And one of the fun things they take you to is a room that was meant for his wife and it had a one-way um, glass she could look down where he was examining his patients to make sure no hanky-panky was going on. And um, I don't know how many of you know Serge Gainsbourg. Um, he was provocateur, singer, songwriter, bad boy, loved to shock audiences. He died in 1991 and his house became a cult, had a cult following. As you can see, they graffiti it all the time, leaving his messages. Occasionally, um, the city will whitewash it, but his fans come back and 
send him graffiti messages. It's very close to the Musée d'Orsay. Many of you know this, it's an old train station. It's a spectacular museum and well worth a visit um, in the neighborhoods around it. Um, across the Seine is the Grand Palais and the Petit Palais. The Grand Palais is currently closed. Um, I believe it's closed till 2024 being renovated. Um, there were all sorts of temporary exhibits there, but you can walk across the street to the Petit Palais, which is actually quite large. It's not small at all. Um, and while it's under, the Grand Palais is under renovation, um, back near the Eiffel Tower is a temporary um, Grand Palais where they have, um, it's an events venue. You can see art there, Paris photo is there, fashion shows. And I believe, it, I read that it will serve as a venue for some Olympic events like wrestling and judo. And going back over to the eighth, um, Place de Concorde is the largest public square in Paris. It has quite a history also, um, and now a famous hotel. Um, it was Place Louis XV, then it was Place de la Revolution, and a thousand people were beheaded here, including uh, um, Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, and um, coincidentally, they happened to be married here. Um, you've got the um, Egyptian obelisk of, that was given in the um, 19th century to, to the French city. Um, in, in the 20s, it was home to wealthy expats. A um, lot of stuff to do here. You see the Ferris wheel. And this fountain, you may recall, um, it's the fountain of river and commerce and navigation. It was a scene in The Devil Wears Prada where Anne Hathaway's character tossed her cell phone into the fountain. One of the, the things I love about Paris are the house, the old house museums. This one was given to the city of Paris by its owner in 1934. Um, it was built originally in 1911 as home. It was a transplanted Turkish, a Turkish Jewish man who bequeathed it to the city and the stipulation that it be named after his son, Nisim, who um, died fighting for France in World War I. The Vichy government, however, forgot this act of patriotism and sent the rest of the family to Auschwitz. Um, it, it is today a museum. It's lovely. It's um, 18th century, his collection of 18th century furnishings and art. A lot of house museums in Paris. And if we move into the ninth, we get to the famous Market Street, uh, Rue de Martier. Um, it was, it, it's, you can see Notre Dame in the north there. And uh, the vendors spill out into the street. It's also one of my favorites. In the ninth, it, this area used to be home in the mid 19th century to a very artistic, literary and musical crowd. Um, they, are, they moved away. It was a very, very quiet neighborhood for many years. And it has become recently um, very bo bohemian, and it's there are a lot of new restaurants um, now. It used to be called the Nouvelle Athens, the New Athens. Um, so one of the uh, museums that remains belonged to a home, painter, Ari Sheffer, and um, they used to have salons there with uh, George Sand, Liszt, um, Franz Liszt, Chopin, and around the corner, practically, is this other house museum, uh, which, and you can visit both of them, um, by painter Gustav Moreau, who was known as a painter's painter. He thought, this is the interior, he thought everyone would forget him, so he decided to hang his own painting, because you can get a sense, he was a, um, 
uh, symbolist and did all these phantasmagoric uh, paintings. And he hung the paintings. They are still hung exactly as he left it. Um, and you get a sense of what the salons were like because this is how they hung paintings back then. Um, moving into the 10th, um, two um, railroad stations that are worth a visit to see the, the architecture um, is Gare de North, the, which takes you to, to the channel. And it's also a spot inside in the movie, if you remember, Amelie, where uh, Audrey Tateau's uh, character almost had a chance encounter with Nino. And about a five minute walk is um, Gare de l'Est, uh, also quite a stunning um, building with lots of uh, statues on the, arch on the uh, facade. Um, the space was increased um, in between 1877 and 1931. Um, a lot of French soldiers in World War I, um, unfortunately, 100,000 of them were, were shipped out. And in World War II, it was used to deport Jews to concentration camps. But just to the, and then another market um, very close nearby on Canal, near Canal Saint Martin. Uh, this is one of the last original. Um, Halls. It's the largest covered market in Paris. It is original iron, iron and glass from the 19th century and made of all these industrial um, materials, has a soaring ceiling and very light filled. And you can buy some food there and go picnic on Canal Saint Martin. Um, many of you perhaps have been there. It used to be a very dicey area but it is now filled with tourists and people roaming around. And right near there is Hotel du Nord, um, which the facade of which is now a historic monument. And um, you can buy food there. It's, um, it was where the, the filming of, the, in 1938, of the film by the same name, where actress Arletti said, atmosphere, atmosphere. And it does indeed have atmosphere along the canal. So in the 11th, um, a few new developments. In fact, there's so many new developments in Paris uh, from when I originally wrote the book. Um, but here we have Marianne, um, a Place de la République, and of course the Bastille. And they have recently changed it. It was rent with the July column where it was a prison and a seven prisoners were released, which started the French Revolution. But it's renovated most recently. There used to be streets all around it. It's now a pedestrian area. It was renovated in 2019, 2021. And a very huge market um, on uh, outdoor market. They have everything there. Um, unusual sites. This use was built by uh, Napoleon, named originally uh, Cirque du Napoleon. Now it's the Winter Circus. You can see the circus there. You can, there are other concert venues are often there too. It's an interesting structure that pops up out of nowhere. Um, many of you in, may know all about the immersion art, which started in Paris at this old warehouse area. Another area that used to be fairly dicey, but it's come back. Um, and this was the first immersion exhibit with um, Gustav Klim. And that was spectacular. Many of you may have seen, they've had it here in Washington. They've just opened in New York, um, a Van Gogh immersion. And I recently saw in September Cezanne and Kandinsky, which was fabulous. And um, moving into the 12th, um, if you know the High Line in New York, this was the same idea. Um, they renovated it. It was an old aqueduct with tracks. Now you can walk your dog, jog along here. And underneath the arches are galleries and boutiques. It's a lovely area. And Natasha, I think, can talk about the food here. This is in um, the Guerre de Lyon. 
uh, which takes passengers south to Lyon and Marseille. And uh, it was a time in the 19th century for sophisticated rail passengers. The name derives from rapid train that went to Côte d'Azur. Um, I have not eaten here. I think Natasha has. Um, probably expensive, but the interior is well worth a look at, and they just let you look. Um, but you could eat here, this the beautiful Belle Epoque dining room. And if we move in um, a little farther field, in the 12th is where old wine warehouses used to be. This is a converted area also. Um, it's now cafes, restaurants, and art galleries, nice place to spend the day. And next to it is um, the Jardin Yitzra Rabin, named after him. There's a big turtle park there, and kids can play there. You can lie in the grass and soak up the sun. And also, um, moving into the 13th, another area that was a little sketchy, but um, a lot of renovation has gone on here, and they move the largest part of the French National Library here. And if you look at the buildings, there are four buildings built like bookends. I've seen some good exhibits here. And aside from research, they, they often have temporary exhibits. Another site you probably aren't familiar with, are the Docks of Paris. It's kind of a fun place to hang out. It's in the 13th, but very close to the 5th. So you can wander over to the gardens in the 5th or the zoo in the 5th. Um, it's for temporary, there's a restaurant on the top and it's a place for temporary exhibits. And um, it, I've seen photography exhibits here. It's design, it's, it's fashion. Um, and more recently, I even saw a um, an exhibit on a cartoon on on comic books there. Well, when the artists like um, Modigliani over here and Picasso in the center, this is an art critic, all decided to move from um, Montmartre to Montparnasse. They made these two restaurants pretty famous, Le Dome and La Rotonde. You can certainly eat there. It's an interesting area. This is, of course, Tower um, Montparnasse, which was really criticized when it was built, but the French love to criticize all the new buildings. Um, cemetery, a recently opened Museum of Liberation. I was there in um, September and saw a fabulous exhibit um, of women war photographers from World War II to the present. Take special kind of courage. It's a great exhibit if you're going soon, and it's also very close to the catacombs. And one of my favorite Sunday markets uh, uh, during the week. You can. It's a food market. It's very accessible. This is an outdoor art market, and um, a lot of it is mediocre art. But sometimes you find some gems, and I have actually found uh, bought a few things here. And the artists are fun to talk to. Most of them know English, but I also try out my French there. And again, okay, you find things you never expected to see in Paris. This is a church. It was uh, built in 1998. This cube-like structure actually conceals an internal frame of a pyramid. I was lucky enough in September during their heritage days, patrimony, um, a lot of buildings that aren't normally open are open. This is La Rouche. Um, it was originally a temporary structure created by Eiffel, um, Gustav Eiffel, as a wine rotunda for the 1900 Universal Exposition. But after it, that closed down, sculptor Alfred Boucher decided to turn it into a cluster of artist studios um, around a central warehouse and named it La Rouche, which means beehive. And it is set up like a beehive. And um, there are about 50 to 60 artists there now. The thing that surprised me about it was how much greenery there were. And these two carry it, it's, these statues were also at the um, 1900 Universal Exposition. So they reused a lot. 
it was almost torn down, but a few artists um, like Calder and Satra, and then the then Minister of um, Culture uh, uh, saved it, and it's now historic. Love the small museums. This one is close to Montparnasse in the 15th. Uh, Antoine Bordel uh, did monumental sculpture. He was a student of Rodin's and he taught Giacometti and Matisse also. It, they have lovely gardens here. It's never very crowded, nice place to sit outside and contemplate the gigantic sculpture that he did. And you can also go inside another small museum moving back into the 16th, but a different part of the 16th is Musée Balzac. And again, nice gardens to sit around. Um, he used to hide here from his creditors, Balzac. And in order to get past his housekeeper, you had to know certain phrases. He lived, he hid from his creditors here from 1840 to 1847. Um, also in the 16th, another part are some wild looking houses. They used to call this the crazy house. It was built by Hector Guimar in 1896 to 98. And he put his own face, which is why it was probably called crazy house into the balconies. Um, but his places are very, um, where's my arrow? Here it is. Um, recognizable, the they facades undulate and um, he lived in this one. You are probably most know him, most well known he is for the Paris Metro entrances. And there is one in New York at MoMA and Natasha told me there's one in the sculpture garden at the National Gallery here in Washington. Another museum, if you love Monet, is um, in the 16th. It's, um, it, he also, they also have temporary exhibits besides Monet's paintings. And across the way is a lovely garden. Um, Back in the 19th centuries, the courtesans and the aristocratic men used to dance under the new gas lights. Today, it's pretty tranquil. You'll see kids running all over the place. There's a, uh, there are sculptures outdoors, and there's you can take a horse and buggy ride. There's a puppet theater, a nice place to hang out. And the, near the Bois de Boulogne in the 16th, um, perhaps you visited it. Um, his art collection, Louis Vuitton's art collection in Bois de Boulogne, uh, built by Frank Gehry. Um, I don't think much of the art he collected personally, but I love the building and it has a great view. If you climb to the top, you can get a docent to give you an art tour and great view of Paris. And of course, I can't leave, as a tennis player, I can't leave the 16th without showing you Terre Battue uh, of the clay courts of Roland Garros, and that is Raphael Nadal, king of the clay. Um, the Arc de Triomphe I was, is, also has a great view of um, Paris. I was lucky enough to be there last year. It was Christo's last project where he wrapped it. It was quite spectacular. And again, little tiny house museums. This was a painter from the 19th century. Um, it's about four floors, seven rooms. I think there was only one other visitor at the time when I was in there. Um, again, his art, he's not well known, but the house is kind of interesting to wander into. And something else you don't consider as part of Paris necessarily that you see in the 17th um, is this little, um, it was an independent village outside of Paris and then um, Napoleon III um, annexed it and brought it in at 1860. Um, Manet lived here for a while and um, Zola. It's just another unexpected part of Paris. And there are markets, as I said, in everyone, this is a pretty large one, fun to, um, wander through. 
And in the 18th, of course, the um, anchor is Sacre Coeur filled with tourists, but it, and it's also the area of the Moulin Rouge and um, the, the dancing girls that um, Toulouse-Lautrec made famous. You can still go and, and see them dance. There's also a sex museum right next to it. But I have to say, having wandered through it, it's pretty tame by today's standards. And um, in the 18th, is uh, where Picasso and others used to hang out. It was owned by Andre, painter and caricaturist uh, Andre Gill. So the name, uh, this is the, the sign that represents it, um, the rabbit, the agile rabbit jumping out of a saucepan. So a little bit of a um, play on his name. Um, but in 1910, there was a hoax there. A critic who didn't like the current art scene, decided to take the owner's donkey named Lolo, attached a paintbrush to it, and created um, a painting, had him squish it, and created a painting that was actually accepted into the modern um, expo of that year. This was probably the smallest museum ever in Paris. It's where Eric Satie lived. I don't believe it's open anymore. But um, Suzanne Valadon was, he was in love with her, wrote her letters and uh, was obsessed with her exquisite hands and tiny feet. Um, she dumped him after six months. She was a model for the likes of Renoir and Toulouse-Lautrec and others, but she was also a painter in her own right. These three belong to museums in the States. This is in DC at the uh, Museum of Women of the Arts. Um, she, uh, if you visit the Musée de Montmartre, it's pretty discreet. It just has this small opening on the left side um, and the back has a big Renoir, uh, Renoir Café. Um, but inside you get to see her studio and her paintings. And there's also an exhibit of what um, Montmartre was like in its heyday, and this was her son's stu uh, Maurice Utrello's uh, studio as well. And it has beautiful gardens, but also about the only, I believe it's the only working vineyard of Paris um, up on the hill of Montmartre. And when I happened to be visiting there, there was a little boy, maybe about seven years old, who um, was uh, very sneaky. He wanted to go in. Clearly, there was a sign that said no entry. His little older sister was admonishing him not to go near it, but he slithered under the gate and was so proud of himself for getting in and out. He did it a couple of times, much to his sister's um, dismay. And there, in the 18th, there is a great... Um, it's like a West African market, really, really busy, probably the least expensive um, food uh, in most all of the markets in Paris or many of them. Keep your wallet in your pocket. It gets very, very crowded, but it's fun. Um, and then into the 19th, um, perhaps you've been here. There's a geodesic dome. It used to be an abattoir. And it's now a city of science and industry. And the best part is the Philharmonie. This was uh, done by uh, French art uh, architect, Jean Novel. To me, it looks like Darth Vader's helmet, but on the first floor, they always have an exhibition. I saw a great exhibition of David Bowie there. And, and then on the second floor is this fabulous uh, concert hall. And again, just go online, get tickets. It's um, great, great acoustics and it, interior in, is quite interesting. Um, parks everywhere. Uh, and this is also in the 19th. And uh, moving into the 20th, perhaps the most famous is the, cemetery, the Père Lachaise Cemetery there. Um, resting place of many famous people. Um, this is the, the real life Romeo and Juliet, the French um, Eloise and Evelard. They are buried there, reunited, having been separated. 
This is Oscar Wilde's very flamboyant um, headstone. And Jim Morrison is buried here. It's a very plain, you have to really be looking for it. And the only thing interesting about it is all the souvenirs that people leave him. And um, this one is of a notorious lady, 19th century ladies man, Victor uh, Noir. And he was killed by a jealous lover. And um, the story goes that this bulge that has been um, rubbed clean is a fertility symbol. So a lot of people come over there if they want kids. And um, a lot of famous people buried here, Sarah Bernhardt, Gertrude Stein, Edith Piaf, Colette, Balzac. And in the 20th, which used to be a kind of rundown area as well, but it's pretty um, famous for the birthplace of Edith Piaf and um, Marie Chevalier. It is, the rents were cheap, artists move in, and now it's pretty hip area as well. And a lot of interesting sites there. This is a Turkish restaurant, um, big pavilion. And uh, in the 19th, we're really in the 80s, built ugly um, high rises. And uh, the city of Paris decided to move a lot of the high rises, which disrupted the views of Paris, um, into the area of La Défense. And this arc perfectly aligns with the Arc de Triomphe. And, um, it was built to commemorate the soldiers who defended Paris in the Franco-Prussian War. Um, I was there one Christmas. They have a Christmas market there. Um, if you're into modern architecture, it's very interesting. And the modern architecture is much more interesting than what was built in the 80s in Paris. So we did a quick Cook's tour. Um, I hope I showed you some things you weren't aware of through the 20 arrondissements of Paris. And um, I would say that just look around, follow your nose, look up at the sky. There are so many interesting places in Paris. You never know what you'll come down, come upon. There are buskers everywhere. This happens to be an Ile, just very close to Ile de Saint-Louis. And um, look around, you may find something you never knew existed. There's so much more. I'd love to hear your stories, what your favorite places are. And I'm gonna turn this back over to Natasha. Um, if there are any comments, I'm happy to ask questions, talk a little more, or hear your favorite places. Well, thank you so much, Kathy. This was just amazing. Such a wonderful virtual trip to Paris. As you said, I really hope that some of you learned something new. I know that someone were taking notes. I apologize. I forgot to record like the first five minutes, but you got the rest, so you will still have it after after this event, I'll send you the link tomorrow and next week at the latest so you can look it back. Um, what did I, oh, yeah, just one little thing I wanted to mention. So this summer, we did, we did a very exciting project. It was called Paris on the Potomac. So it was a photo competition. So people were taking pictures of what inspires them uh, here in DC in terms of Parisian culture or architecture or French architecture in general. And we found some very interesting places I never knew about. So I know that you, Kathy, at the very beginning, you showed this Louvre pyramid right in front of, um, well, in front of the Louvre, right? And actually, I don't know if any of you know, but the architect is the Chinese American architect whose name is uh, uh, pay, I am pay, you spell it P-E-I, and actually he commissioned and he um, planned the pyramids first here in DC. So if you go to the National Gallery of Art, you will see a smaller version of this pyramids right there. He did it in 1968. He was approached to design the National Gallery of Arts West Building where he created the gas pyramid skylights. And only later on, in 1983, he was um, asked by the French president Mitterrand to modernize the Louvre, and that's when he built the one in France. So it's, I yeah. thought it was quite um, uh, interesting to know that, and also kind of like I feel 
I don't know, honored <laughs> that we had those pyramids first in a way. <laughs> so yeah, I just wanted to share this um, little snippet of information. But yeah, now it is your time. If you have any questions, let me look here at the chat. Someone says, uh, Jennifer, I missed a bit about the month when some buildings are open that aren't usually. Which month was that? Oh, it's September. It's called the Patrimoine. Patrimoine. Yes. And it, yeah. this year it was around September 20th, I believe. Okay. Well, I have a question for you, uh, Kathy. We didn't talk much about that. Can you tell us about your love story with France and Paris? How did it all start? <laughs> um, well, it, I guess it started by accident. I mean, I had always wanted to spend time there. And when my son was in college, I thought, I, I'm going to just go to Paris for a month. I did it for the month of April, which is kind of funny. I had gorgeous days in, in that entire month. Um, I used to work for the Smithsonian. So when I came back, I was um, doing consulting and I went to the book trade fair in New York. And one of the publishers who did a lot of work with us in um, uh, when I worked for the Smithsonian, I stopped by to say hello. And he handed me a giant coffee table book, uh, 1000 Buildings of New York. Um, and I thought he was just showing me new titles. I was very enthusiastic about telling him about my month in Paris. And he looked at me and he said, the next one is Paris. And I said, I'll do it. Knowing so naively what I was getting myself into, a thousand buildings is a lot of research. And they only gave me about six months to do it. I was so panicked. <laughs> um, but um, that's when I started the real love affair with Paris and walking all over. And I, he knew my writing because I had written a book called The Fearless Shopper, looks at shopping as a way to explore cultures. And um, from my time working as a buyer and merchandise manager for the Smithsonian Museum stores. Um, so um, that's how I got to, he sent me to Paris. I, he thought I could write the whole thing from my desk at home. And I took it for the opportunity that it was. And I rented a place and, and stayed in Paris for, in the 18th um, for uh, six months. Great, thank you. And uh, maybe just one more question. Um, would you, what would you recommend um, for those who are going to Paris for the first time? And also in terms of language, would you recommend learning some basics before going? Would that help? Or for how long do you think um, it would be useful to learn French before going? Um, it certainly would be useful to take a basic course. And when you walk in to any store, especially if you're in the center of Paris, say bonjour. Um, it, if you walk in and just expect to speak English, the French, the Parisians resent that. And I always say, oh, when I walk in and they don't quite understand my French, I go, oh, excuse-moi, je ne peux pas bien français. I don't speak French very well. And they go, oh, no, madame, said excellent. And they keep, and they just help me. Um, I, I definitely think you should know a few words of French before you go. In the center of Paris these days, if you speak French, and it's obvious that you're not native, they will answer you, especially the young people, they will answer you in English. But I always say I have to practice my French. And it, where I rent an apartment in the 16th, it's a little place um, uh, near Pont Mirabeau. And even if they know English, um, they'll speak French to me so I can practice. Um, it, it's, what was the first part of your question? What do I recommend? Oh, you have to go to the tourist sites first, the, the Eiffel Tower. People always ask me what my favorite building is in Paris. And as cliche as it is, I love the Eiffel Tower because it's all these industrial parts and rivets and metal. And I think it's very elegant. And the, I mean, you can climb to the top or you can take an elevator. It's a great view. Yes, it's crowded with tourists, but you have to do it at least once. Um, so uh, you have to 
you know, it depends what you love. You can sit in a cafe and watch the world go by. It's another favorite thing to do. Yeah, definitely. Getting lost in Paris is um, amazing. You know, there's this French word, planeur, for yes. a person who just wanders around, flaner. So I definitely recommend that. Uh, and yeah, I've also heard like even Parisians, when they have guests visiting, they still sort of showcase the first arrondissement and the Eiffel Tower to 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 show Paris to them. You can't just not go there. <laughs> I mean, you can spend a week at the Louvre alone at, at the museum. So pick one exhibit and go see it. Um, you know, and and um, there is a wonderful if it's still up because I think they're still planning to open Notre Dame in 2024 during the Olympics. Um, but the last time I was there, there was a great photo exhibit. You can get much closer to it now than you could the, um, right after the fire. And there's a wonderful photo exhibit all around there. Yes, yes. So there were some other, honestly, thank you so much. There's so many recommendations. I think I will save the chat as well and I will share it with you all. Well, thank you all so much. Yes, if you do want to learn French, we have um, many, many different classes. We have a standard grammar classes and uh, conversation, but also some, we just opened actually a new class, which is just aimed at travelers to Paris. So you can pick up some um, useful vocabulary before going, or you can dive into a more serious learning and do all levels one after another. Well, thank you so much, Kathy, for joining us tonight. It's always a great pleasure to have you. My and bonsoir à tout le monde. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.